Well, thank you very much, Liz, and I thank the council and the uh, Blue Mountains Planetary Health Initiative for inviting me. It's actually, uh, I was invited four years ago, I think, uh, uh, when the book was brand new. And of course, uh, it couldn't happen straight away. And, uh, and then COVID hit and it didn't happen. So I'm really pleased that four years later, it's now happening and that uh, uh, with a bit of luck, uh, there'll be more of me, uh, whether you like me or not, in the Blue Mountains uh, next year because uh, uh, Jill and I are thinking, well, more than thinking, we're, we're actually actively in the uh, planning and engaging in moving from uh, Wallaby Farm uh, to Blackheath. And so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'm really pleased to be here and I feel as if I'm already in a, uh, an audience that is ready for this transition that I'm going to talk about tonight, which is this uh, acknowledging that we're in a state that um, in scientific and more popular terms is called the Anthropocene, which is this period of human dominance, which is expressing itself in a multitude of ways. I don't want to say too much about it because uh, like Liz, I find it so depressing that uh, I, I want to chill out and go and do something else rather than uh, uh, contemplate our own catastrophe. Um, I want to uh, not only enter the symbiocene, but I feel as if I'm in it already. And I'll tell you uh, hopefully enough about it for you to uh, not only want to be in it, but uh, be so committed to it that you'll never want to get out. So let's see how we go. So uh, I'd like to pay my respects to those indigenous people who traversed this land prior to human settlement and who are still here. I'm interested in the origins of the word, or all words, that's one of my things. Uh, Katoomba seems to be a fascinating uh, name and a, a, uh, with a contested but interesting history. Um, my wife and I lived in Newcastle for a very long time uh, and its indigenous name was Mullabimba, and it was uh, connected to the, the ferns that uh, the Awabagal people harvested on the creeks that fed into the, uh, into the estuary of the Hunter River. And so Mullabimba was place of the edible sea ferns, or ferns by the sea. And it seems to me that uh, Katoomba has a similar origin. So I feel as if I'm moving from one place of ferns to another. So uh, clearly there's something really interesting going on there. I'm sure the, uh, the history is more uh, complex than that, but I acknowledge the, uh, the, the people who traversed this land, who occupied it, who lived on it and uh, respected it, and more than respected it, uh, 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 for tens of thousands of years. So, uh, a philosopher that's interested in emotions, you don't have to read this, it's just there to remind me what to say next. <laughs> <laughs> but the book Earth Emotions is about my attempt as a philosopher, thinker, adult, uh, man, uh, father, grandfather, trying to work out what is my emotional connection to uh, my place. And place is multi-dimensional. It's uh, where you live, it's your home, it could even be your planet. <clears throat> but uh, the word emotion has its origins in the Latin uh, to, to move or to be agitated. And, and it is the emotions that ultimately move us. If we not moved by hard facts, it's often our emotions that are going to lead us into a change, uh, one that we welcome. Whether they're good emotions or bad emotions, the emotions are powerful agents in our lives and we often neglect them. We often say that uh, emotions get in the way of being rational. Emotions get in the way of being scientific. In my view, if you're emotionally uh, coherent, if your emotional compass is pointing you in the right direction, there's good science, there's good technology, there's good everything else that society has to offer. There is no uh, contradiction between emotional states and so-called rational states. So that's where I want our emotions to end up. I acknowledge that right now we're, uh, we're convoluted, we're discombobulated, we're confused. We're at war, where the, the original meaning of the word war is to be mixed up or confused. So 
We live in a world that exemplifies the basis of our emotions, both good and bad, both orderly and disorderly. Uh, some people would categorise it as evil and good, but I'm not going to go too far into the evil and good side of things. I just want to say that our emotional choreography reflects the state of the world over deep time. And so uh, Indigenous people who have been, for example, on a continent like Australia for tens of thousands of years, their emotional lives were tied to the, uh, the land, its geography, its, its ecology, uh, and the, uh, the cosmos above them was all intimately connected. So I want to see the word emotion in a very broad sense. <coughs> Yeah, it's nice feeling moony every so often. <laughs> so I, I create words. So I'm not happy with just a biography, which is the story of a person's life. I want a symbiography. The Greek symbios is the root word for symbiosis. It means uh, to be together, to be uh, united in a sense, to have companionship. And I wanted to know in my biography what it was that produced this philosopher that was interested in nature. Well, in the beginning, a kid interested in nature, a nature boy. Uh, why did I become a lover of birds? Why did I actually want to save the world from destruction, from despots and tyrants? What was it about my upbringing that uh, led me to this uh, position as a philosopher trying to uh, uh, change the world from one state to another. So this idea of a symbiography is something that you can all undertake. It's an exercise in environmental education, if you like. How do you, how do you uh, accommodate the, uh, the person you are in the world that's changing around you? If you feel sadness about the destruction of uh, habitat, koala habitat, for example, there's something already in you, which is a positive earth emotion, the title of my book. There's something there where you react and you feel something that's uh, emotionally powerful, tearing you apart. You can only have that if you already had the positive opposite. So your biography is full of these emotional states. They're not binaries. They're on a spectrum. Uh, they move from intensely negative to intensely positive. So I, I want to take you on an emotional journey rather than one which uh, documents what's going wrong in the biophysical world. That's a grey fantail photographed on Wallaby Farm. It's my bird totem. When I was a kid, they used to hover around me whenever I went into the forest and I thought, I must be special. This bird loves me. And it turns out that I was a human broom just sweeping up insects for them to hover around and, and uh, pick, pick up something whenever they felt like it. But it remained a very special bird for me. So I decided that it would be my bird totem for the rest of my life. I'm hoping to find at least one in Blackheath one day. Now, uh, it was mentioned that I talk about this thing called solastalgia. Well, solastalgia has a long story behind it, and I'll just very briefly touch on it tonight because it's a negative emotion story, and I want to focus on the, the positive. But again, as I said just a few seconds ago, unless you already have within you some powerful positive connection to your patch, your your place, your particular part of the earth, or even a sense of uh, intense uh, identification with the earth as a whole, you can only feel the distress when it's being violated or destroyed if you already have this uh, positive stuff in you. So if you suffer from solastalgia, it already means that you're intensely environmental. So solastalgia, why did I create it? it it's based on the concept of nostalgia, which is not that sentimental feeling that you have when you want to go back to the era of Elvis Presley and you can't because he's dead. Nostalgia, as defined by Hoffa in the 17th century, was an intense emotional feeling of loss when you were absent from home and wished to return. They, the homesickness was so powerful it could kill you. So you had not only a, a series of emotional breakdowns, but it could affect your 
uh, your body as well. You could en end up with a, a, a whole series of f uh, bodily and mental uh, breakdowns that could, uh, according to Hoffa, kill you. What was the cure for nostalgia? Well, it was to be sent home. If you're a soldier fighting on a foreign shore and you claimed you were suffering from nostalgia and uh, your homesickness was making you unable to be uh, fit for service, they, uh, they would test you in the Russian army to make sure that you were genuine. But the ultimate cure would be to be sent home, to be repatriated back to the fatherland, uh, where you would recover and then uh, be sent back to the front line only to be killed. So the, the idea of solastalgia is based on nostalgia, but with a, an important difference. The solace that you have when you're in your home environment can be shattered by forces that are beyond your control. Solastalgia is the homesickness you have when you're at home and your home environment's being changed around you in ways that you find distressing. So old nostalgia, you're away from home and can't return and wish to. Solastalgia from 2003 onwards, uh, you're at home and something's invading your home environment in such a way that you find it so distressing that you can no longer get solace or comfort from the place where you, where you live. So it's the lived experience of negative environmental change. It's attacking your sense of place. Where do you get it? Well, I don't come from the hunter and the upper hunter without having the experience of, of solastalgia. Uh, it was generated this whole idea as a, not just as an academic response, but as a personal emotional response by witnessing firsthand the open cut coal mines of the Upper Hunter. And that's uh, Bengala open cut over a decade ago. It's now twice the size, but somewhere here, uh, there is the one of the world's largest machines. It's an electric shovel or drag line. So the, the scale on which this uh, open cut to the earth is taking place is just ginormous. And of course, uh, there were people living there that were experiencing a, a distress that they knew was connected to the state of their home, their earth, but there wasn't a word for it. So I, I created a word which was based on uh, solace, alger, uh, means uh, many things, but uh, it's not only the doctors that have a, uh, a stake in algaes or, or, or pain. It's, uh, it affects your emotions. Uh, it's uh, a word that the Greeks used for quite a, a range of, of uh, negative physical and emotional states. So that's the Anthropocene, if you like. That's coal coming out of the Upper Hunter. And that's the empty trains taking the, uh, the, wag the, the empty wagons are going back in to be filled up. Uh, I've taken one photo which I uh, think covers the meaning of the Anthropocene, the word that we started on the title. That's Bayswater Power Station and uh, in the front of it is one of the world's largest open cut coal mines. It's a bit hazy because I had to take the photo through a barbed wire fence. But the, the point is this, that we are terraforming the earth at such a scale, locally, regionally, and then we import it back into Australia as uh, global warming. So we export coal and import climate change, climate chaos. So that's what I think the Anthropocene means. And as we're physically degrading this earth, at local, regional and planetary level, we are also degrading our own mental integrity. We are causing ourselves physical and mental distress. There's not a direct one-way causal flow here, but there's quite clearly a relationship between the state of the earth and the state of our psyches, the state of our emotional well-being. The more you feel at home, the more you feel integrated with your local system of life, the better off you feel mentally and emotionally. So that's part of the thesis that I'm putting to you tonight is that the Anthropocene is actually driving us mad. It's driving us into a state of distress and that if we don't get out of it, sure, we might die of toxic poisoning or 
some other horrible event that's in the biophysical world. And plenty of people are in that state now with floods and disasters. But what's the mental health impact of that, uh, the anthrop Anthropocene cranking out this physical uh, damage and distress? It's, uh, I would argue, enormous. So it's another image I I've, I've, was uh, driving along uh, one of the roads uh, in uh, in my area, and I just so happened to, you know, I'm bird nut, so I noticed this bird shape on the road, and I saw the white line that had gone over it, and I realised that this is a sign of the Anthropocene. We don't we care so little about life uh, or even death in the Anthropocene that we just go straight over it with a, a new layer, another strata, and so. This uh, poor bird that had been smashed by a car then had the, the, the white line drawn over it. And it's the essence of our neglect of life and its value. So there are a whole range of earth emotions that are negative. I mentioned solastalgia because I created it. There are others like uh, Hoffa in 1688. That's how old nostalgia is. That's the genuine one, not not the modern one, which is the, the sentimentality. Necrophilia, it's not what you think it is. Well, maybe it is, but it's also just a more general love of death. You know, uh, people that seem to actually like things dying around them. Biophobia, the fear of life or the uh, wanting to get rid of as much life around you as possible because you're, you feel more uh, stable or safe as long as there's no no life uh, other than perhaps humans or your own around you. Uh, global dread, that's one I shared with my wife Jill many years ago, when you wake up in the morning, there was nothing but bad news. And the dread, the fear of the future uh, invades or pervades everything. Nature deficit disorder, that's uh, Richard Louvre. Our children are now grow growing up in a world that's so severely depauperate compared to the one that I lived in or my grandparents lived in. Uh, children being born today uh, are suffering from nature deficit disorder while their adults suffer from artifact overload disorder. Sorry, I can't talk to you now, I'm on the phone. Ecoparalysis, a number of people started using that term uh, to describe the overwhelming sense of, well, what can I do? This thing that's changing is so powerful that I'm just one person. There's nothing I can do about it. And there are a whole slew of new words that are uh, connected to the changing climate. Uh, Eco-anxiety, climate anxiety, eco-grief, environmental grief. Grief is appearing more and more in the literature that I read on the emotional impact of climate change. So let's finish, in a sense, at that point with the Anthropocene. I've already said that the opposite must also be within you as you experience these uh, hugely negative changes to your emotional and mental well-being. Uh, as um, Liz mentioned, the, uh, the, the symbiocene is a term that I've created because I wanted a mega meme at least as powerful and at least as big as the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene actually is so huge, they don't come much bigger than memes like that. So I had to come up with something that was outlandishly large. And so the symbiocene is my attempt to come up with uh, an idea that's the equal and opposite of the Anthropocene and hopefully more than its equal, it's going to win. It's going to defeat the Anthropocene. So it comes from the Greeks uh, uh, symbiosis, which was a bit originally applied to social life in ancient Greece, companionship, friendship, collaboration with others. It may even be connected to the, uh, uh, the marriage of men and women or uh, whatever gender happens to enjoy the idea of being married. Uh, it may even refer to uh, the, the Greek symbiosis might refer, refer to a sexual uni union as well. But it means living together. And the German scientists that created the scientific term symbiosis in the uh, uh, late 19th century, uh, they were working well, on um, mycelium. They were working on 
lichens. They were realizing that there was more going on in this world than uh, competition and nature red in tooth and claw. There was cooperation going on. And this ancient Greek word for uh, you know, living together, being united, collaborating, cooperating, uh, mutualism, that became part of uh, our language and it's been uh, used and, uh, and promoted ever since. So I wanted symbiosis to be the basis of this new era or scene uh, in human history. Now, of course, we're not in it. So the uh, symbioscene has to be an act of creation. Uh, it's a, a conceptual or, uh, or intellectual, emotional leap as well. Once you realize that we do have alternatives to the Anthropocene, we're not stuck in it, we can get out. Uh, symbiosis and the symbiocene provide the key to do that. So it occurred to me also when I was thinking about negative and positive emotions that our emotional relationship to the earth and the biophysical environment in the English language doesn't have a lot of content. There aren't many words that we use to describe our love of our relationship to our place, our land, our continent, our earth. So it, it occurred to me that this is a strange gap in this particular culture and its language. And I've said about trying to replace the negative emotions that we describe in the Anthropocene with positive ones that we might have to rediscover or redescribe and some that we have to invent from the, the very beginning. But what I can tell you is that the Anthropocene has taken away the ability to have these positive emotional experiences. We're being bulldozed. We're having our, our emotional uh, variety being beaten out of us. And that if we want it back, we're going to have to change from living in a, uh, in a scene, an era, uh, where our emotional engagement with life, the rest of life that's not human, and the, the vast array of living relationships all over this planet, including 10 kilometres below the surface with um, deep uh, earth uh, microbiomes and bacteria. This, this is a, a huge job. Well, let's, let's take it on. So here's some positive earth emotions for you. Biophilia, love of life, the... Uh, Psychoanalyst Eric and philosopher Eric Fromm gave us that idea. Uh, E.A. Wilson popularised it. Uh, symbiophilia, well, symbios living together, the love of living together. A lot of, uh, a lot of us have sort of lost that particular emotion as well. Uh, particularly the idea of uh, loving, the idea of living with the brown snake that lives near my chicken shed right now. <laughs> It's a tense relationship that I have. <laughs> Endemophilia, endemos, uh, love of the local, demos of the people, that which is dwelling in the people of a particular place. I mean, I actually love certain square meters of Wallaby Farm. It's that precise. I love that particular spot. It's that which is endemic, that is very special about places like Katoomba, Blackheath, the other places of the Blue Mountains that still have their integrity. Solophilia, the, the love of working with others. I, I like the word solidarity, but it seems to have been appropriated by the left and the right hate that, so I want to get out of party politics and the old politi political spectrum. So solophilia is, is an idea that we can collaborate beyond the old left-right right, uh, boundaries. UT area, that's another one I've invented, which is uh, uh, a feeling of, uh, of oneness with the earth, such that the, the divide between the self and the other or the, uh, the, the rest of uh, life and its experience is obliterated. Um, surfers have it when they get the perfect wave. You know, it's, you're, you're at one with, with, with the ocean. Um, and, and some more spiritually minded people also feel this sense of oneness with uh, the, the forces of life that are uh, surrounding us. Uh, that's me, a uh, bit younger, 
like about 12 years younger, uh, at Gurulong uh, Brook in Jarradale in the uh, Darling Ranges, where uh, I was living at the time when working at, at uh, Murdoch University. But there's this flow of water that comes uh, with much needed rain and there's uh, this feeling that I'm totally at one with this this moment, like I, I, I almost had it this morning because we hadn't had rain for so long at Wallaby Farm that just a drizzle was like, oh yes, this is fantastic. It's spiritual, but not the kind of spirituality that I've seen in the past. I call it the, uh, the Gedeist. Ged is a word uh, in old language which means uh, to unite. It's the root word for words like together or together or good. That g sound in those words is uh, where we get uh, our, our language from. So I, I decided that I'm being a, a kind of secular, materialist, hard-headed, realist type philosopher that I needed a spirituality that was more in keeping with my own thinking. So I invented it. It's uh, uh, the Gedeist is that uh, feeling of oneness with the rest of life from the micro to the macro. And what's new about our spiritual relationship is that we need to acknowledge that it's actually built from the micro up. You know how these, I used to think the grassroots was really deep. We've got to go deeper and smaller than that. It's the microbiome. It's the uh, mycorrhizae of fungi. It's even smaller than that. The, the forces of life are coming from the tiniest things that exist on this planet. And they're building life from that tiny base up to big things like us. We've always thought about big things outside of us, big church, big, big man, big, big tree. Well, that's not the way life works. Uh, we often think of Gaia as uh, the big whole planet thing. Well, if there is a Gaia, it's built from microorganisms up. It's not built from Gaia somehow giving us miraculous uh, things at the, at the bottom level. So I think that's a spiritual thing in that uh, humans thinking about uh, the opposite of the way that we used to think about spirituality is also in itself spiritual. And so I'll, I'll leave you to contemplate that one as well. Um, I thought about that. Uh, I, I had a slide that I used to use to illustrate this spirituality, which was Stonehenge. But of course, I'm, I'm not talking to an international audience. I'm talking to Katoomba. Well, I read the story of the, the naming of the three sisters in Aboriginal, uh, let's call it cosmology, the dreaming. Uh, and it's an incredible story. And so our own landscape contains spirituality in a way that we've yet to really understand ourselves. I, I go to that place and I look at the tourists and the shop and the cars and how well organised it is. But there doesn't seem to be a skerrick of spirituality there unless you take it and give it to it, unless you understand some of its uh, history, that history being tens of thousands of years old. So I think we now need, uh, at all ages, Generation Symbiocene. Generation Anthropocene have had their day. They've done a really good job wrecking the planet, wrecking our mental health, wrecking our physical health. It's time for a new generation to take over. And I don't mean by Generation Symbiocene only those that are in the young uh, let's get out and change the world uh, age group. It's probably roughly the average age of the people in this room would be my favourite target for Generation Symbiocene. So the work that needs to be done from now on, I describe it as smart, fast and furious. We're busy building the Anthropocene and we have measures of it like gross national product. The opposite growth, growth that is good, growth that represents what uh, humans are doing when they, uh, they go from infancy into adulthood. You know, I don't see growth as inherently bad. I think it's fantastic that we need a different measure and everyone's had a go at a, a, a different measure than gross national product. Everyone knows it's growth. But uh, gross Sumbio regional product 
the S has to be connected to symbiosis. So instead of arguing only for negative growth and back to the cave, I'm arguing for the complete collapse of gross national product at the same time as a gross symbiotic product goes up. So in other words, instead of us only having one option, which is the negative, to stop doing things, uh, to pretend that somehow or another 8 billion people are going to go back to subsistence agriculture, ain't going to happen. We're going to have to be smarter. We're going to have to start doing things in ways that are radically different, but connected to the foundations of life. So the Symbiocene revolution is on already. Uh, I think Greta has, uh, can take a lot of credit for it. When I wrote Earth Emotions, she wasn't even in the news. And yet a year later, uh, she was heading uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people worldwide protesting about the symbol of the Anthropocene, uh, fossil fuels and climate change. These guys, um, rising tide in Newcastle, stopped the coal train and they, um, I think the person who's crouched down in the middle was a 92 year old woman. So that's generation symbiocene for you. The kids of Newcastle, school strike for climate change, inspired by Greta. So they, they obviously are looking at a, a transition, a change from business as usual from the Anthropocene to something new. Even architects are beginning to think differently about the future. That means it's a kind of hierarchical structure where male architects rule the world of building. So I, I, I said you, become, you need to become symbiotechs and practice symbiotecture. So they're starting to do it. They've actually changed the uh, division that does the work on fungi and mycelium uh, to the Department of Symbiotecture, which I think is a, a fantastic honour that I've been given. So Symbios, living together, techno to, to build. The, as I say, the archie in architecture means to rule, command, it's got to go. Sorry about that, architects, but you've had your day, it's time to move on. <laughs> well, you could just change. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, 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 quite a few years old, that structure now, but the idea that uh, mycelium can be used to build large structures is a, a radical way of thinking about how we can live in the future. So radical that you could even begin to think about uh, feeding or giving nutrition to the bricks of your building so that they self-repair. You know, it, you can do all sorts of things where you animate your relationship to where you live. So we've lost animism as a part of our lives. Uh, indigenous people uh, experience the world as living, as in some sense totally alive. Well, we've lost that, but we can put it back, and I'll show you uh, some more examples of how. So, you know, you can have your Wheaties, and then you can eat your bowl, <laughs> because we're starting to make things out of edible, compostable materials that don't get thrown away. They, they, if they are, they're going straight into the compost heap where they become earthworm food. Uh, so the idea that we just have to keep doing what we've done in the past is silly and dangerous. Uh, our clothing industry is one of the worst polluters on the planet. We're now using um, uh, mushrooms to make uh, fabulous materials that uh, designers and, and uh, clothing makers all over the world are starting to look at how we could change that. You could imagine if every one of us in this room was wearing something made out of mushrooms, already there'd be a, an, an enormous change from uh, polystyrene, uh, non-organic cotton, you know, you name it. And you think that's where it ends. Well, it's actually just the beginning because we're now starting to produce electricity from bacteria and algae. Uh, and it's also an exercise in the new animism, I call it. Um, you know, you can imagine uh, a wall, a large wall that's filled with uh, uh, tubes and reservoirs, in it are uh, zillions, trillions of uh, bacteria just busting 
to have a chemical reaction that you contribute to, to put your lights on. Or it could be algae. It's just, well, it's just stuff that lives, that produces reactions. And the, the, the diagram shows a man pissing into a urinal, which is step one. Uh, that urine is full of nitrogen. It's full of all sorts of other materials, chemicals that living things need. You can also extract uh, other nutrients that can go straight into feeding plants. But importantly, uh, microbiology can con convert your urine into something which can turn the lights on. Now, at the moment, we can only power tiny little lights. But if we stop subsidising fossil fuels and put trillions into mm. these guys that are struggling to get even a research budget on how to turn the lights on by uh, having a good piss, well, that's revolutionary. We, we actually need to start engaging in that idea. If children are involved in this, that to turn the lights on, it's like looking after chickens or having a pet dog. You've got to see the relationship between your life and the materials, the lights, the power that you use as intimately connected. It's the severing of that just by going, going click, click, you don't have any connection to the technology. You have no idea about where the power came from. It's about the, the same with food. You don't know where the food in the super, supermarket comes from. You don't even know that it's food half the time, probably because it isn't. Um, microculture, again, uh, George Mombio and others have uh, said, look, there's so many of us that we can't actually just keep cutting down forests and having more cows and uh, it's just as bad with respect to milk and dairy products as it is with meat. So we're now using microculture, engaging with the life that microbes live. You give them nutrients, they'll start producing mozzarella cheese. Not only does it look like mozzarella cheese, not only does it taste like mozzarella cheese, but it also melts off the side of your, your toast like mozzarella cheese. So that's not coming from a cow at all. It's coming from the kind of technology that's using uh, microbes that want to do what we want uh, from them, which is you tweak them a bit, uh, you don't even have to genetically engineer them, and you'll end up, that is in fact a picture of uh, micro-produced mozzarella. So uh, we're doing the same with so many other, other things. So I'll conclude now. Some of you might think this is utopian, and you're probably right, but it's not the, not the utopia that you think it is. Utopia, spelt with U-T, is an idea developed by Thomas More to describe a future that can't happen, an impossible place. You, cannot, you can imagine the possibility of it, but it actually can't eventuate. Um, utopia, a very simple shift. EU means, means good. That can be translated as a good place. And so we can now begin to see the difference between a utopia, which is the Anthropocene. We can stay in it, but if you project it into the future, it goes poof because it's a complete annihilation of the possibility of life, particularly for humans but of most life on this planet. There's plenty of stuff that's resilient in, and tough. You know, there, there are bacteria, thermophiles, that like living in the vents of undersea volcanoes. So we're not gonna wipe out all life, even if we tried really hard. But the idea of continuing the Anthropocene uh, is a recipe for annihilation. If we want collapse, then I want the Anthropocene to collapse. If that's all that we want, if we can only focus on the collapse process, then I'm afraid I'm not going to be your uh, partner on that grief road. I want us to move into the other side, which is a genuine utopia, a good place in the future that we will enjoy being in. It will give us back all of the things that we now talk about that have been absorbed by the evil forces of the Anthropocene, you know, resilience. Well, there are plenty of companies that destroy the earth that call themselves resilient. Uh, regenerative, 
um, the Vic Forests call themselves doing uh, regenerative forestry. Well, they clear fell. That's not regenerative. So the symbiocene will begin to put back into our language the words that have been appropriated by the captains of the Anthropocene and give them back their meaning. We'll also need some new words because the new world that we're building is not the same as the one that was 10,000 years ago. It's going to be an emergent hybrid state. It will contain the best of Indigenous thinking, the best of our, uh, our, uh, our, our scientific thinking and technology, the best emotional uh, states that humans can have. So you get all these things, plus you get positive Earth emotions. We get back the emotions that we've lost and we get back with new terminology uh, emotions that we thought had gone extinct. But we're now going to name them. We're going to uh, revere those emotions and we're not going to let them die out. So that's why I write the subtitle of my book, New Words for a New World. We don't, I don't imagine going backwards. I imagine humans going into a future, reconnecting to the forces that generated the life that they're a part of, using the best of the knowledge systems that we have, including indigenous knowledge systems. And uh, terra libid, which means let the earth live, we'll be punching the air. The evil ones will be uh, lost in the dust as we move forward. And this is work for, the, for our children and grandchildren, uh, but it's work that grandparents probably have to do harder and faster than anyone else because we're not going to be around for much longer. So thank you for your patience and uh, questions and things will be fine with, with Liz's uh, permission. National Parks was here. They said, you're getting a really big crowd to philosophy on a Thursday night. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes. And the power of philosophy and thinking and ideas that you've just shown us um, is impacting what we're doing in government. And so it is actually turning into reality, so, you know, into action. So. Now we'd like to hand over to you to ask some questions of Glenn while he's here. Would anyone like to make a comment or ask a question in response to this? Or are you just still processing it? <laughs> <laughs> I do have one question. Uh, Glenn, uh, population, eight point something billion people predicted to go up to something like 11 billion. Uh, we cannot afford, if we want to survive, to take one more metre of land away from the other species that inhabit this planet of ours. So do you have any, any ideas of how we can take our, our current the space that we've occupied and over-occupied and transform it so that we, we can live? Well, um, one of the ideas was to get rid of... Um animal-based agriculture and use our friends, the microbes, because uh, the microbe factory can actually produce more food on a space that's uh, a, a tiny fraction of what we use for rangelands or feedlots or intensive chicken farms. So we just have to start thinking uh, differently about our food sources, because you're right, um, 10 billion of us taking more and more of the planet. It's it's just more of the Anthropocene. So I would suggest that uh, I don't have a recipe for how to get people to have less children than they do, but I think the ethics of arguing that replacement level uh, population uh, is probably not a bad thing and that there are many people who would choose not to have children. And so ultimately uh, that would be uh, a way of gradually reducing uh, the population to something which is in inverted commas sustainable. Uh, it also means we have to change our um, 
mothering, fathering, child rearing practices, shared parenting, a whole lot of stuff where we get rid of uh, parent or mother monopolised child rearing and, uh, and put children back into a communal and social setting. So I'm not the sort of person that's, uh, um, you know, like zero population growth and let's do this in an authoritarian way. I, I'm the sort of person that thinks that we start getting the symbiocene up and running, people will voluntarily uh, have less children. We'll be smart enough to figure out how that's possible. Uh, we're already smart enough to have worked out uh, um, contraception to a fairly sophisticated degree. It's probably going to have to go much more in the direction of men doing the contraception than women, but that, that's, that's just because we didn't put enough money into uh, the right side. But, you know, that, that's just dumb stuff. We can do really smart stuff from now on. That's part of the argument is that we, we are, in fact, uh, supposedly homo sapiens, wise apes. Um, what we've done so far is to mainly burn and explode things. Well, that's really dumb. You know, anybody could do that. And so what we need to do is to start thinking as, uh, as our intelligence uh, gives us, uh, it's a gift, uh, to what are smarter ways that we can do all these things? Uh, and can we do it in a way that's not engaging in the annihilation of people? Uh, you know, uh, the mass refugees that we're going to have if the Anthropocene goes even for uh, another decade. So that's my answer to it, which is not a simple one, but it would, over decades, the pop population uh, uh, will come down but it will do so voluntarily. Yeah. I was just thinking, is, is part, well, part of that to me seems to be our obsession with stuff, far too much stuff that we actually don't need. I mean, I find it outrageous that we're still producing faster and racier cars and thinking about going into space when, you know, we've got this crisis happening around us. So how many of these wasteful things you know, that we collect and we want to have and all that sort of, you know, make things better. Yeah, technology is great, but what about all this stuff we keep producing? Well, that's part of the, the side of the equation that's uh, plummeting down. So that's, you know, uh, really attacking gross national product as fast as we can. The, the difference that I think I'm contributing is the idea that we've got to have something that's going up, not necessarily just as fast, but it's certainly is giving young people the hope that they, they can be employed, that they can have careers, that they can actually engage in the process of being human, not just by giving up everything, uh, using their intelligence and their education in a way that would drive something which is uh, a, a, a goal worth having. So the idea of the symbiocene is to give young people in particular a vision of the future that they find compelling that they actually want to create and build themselves. Our job is to you know, help them do it as best we can, but also to get out of the way. Yeah. I had a comment on that question that you asked about uh, population growth and consumption. Um, well, the consumption of the whole world is about not just how many people there are, but how many resources each individual person uses. So reducing the resource usage of individual people can bring down, like even with a higher population, can still be sustainable. And the other thing I wanted to mention was about population growth is not even across the whole world. There are some countries that have higher and lower population growth and plenty of countries even have negative population growth. And the correlation that I've read is that it's about the education level. Countries with good education systems seems to have lower population growth, like Sweden has negative population growth, Japan has negative population growth, even Australia would have negative population growth if we didn't have such a massive immigration intake, like our actual the number of babies we have is not enough for replacement even in Australia. Um, so it's not all bad news. There are places in the world where population is coming down, there are places in the world where resource usage like, um, is less, not in Australia. <laughs> Yeah, and that, I quite agree that uh, you, you tie population to a, an, uh, an, an economy which is based on extraction 
it, it's a recipe for disaster because it's, it's, it's going to keep driving greater uh, levels of population where poor people have got no choice, no, no, no option. Uh, they're just being human. So I think you, you're on the right track completely. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that that trend that you observed, in, uh, uh, the better the education, the more equitable and uh, the more just the society, uh, the closer we, we get to um, a, a steady state population rather than one that's continuing to climb. Yeah, I just want to, I mean, as a comment to that before I go on, in fact, you also have to take into account first world, third world conditions, yeah. right? That people whose children, they can't guarantee their children will survive because of the level of disease and ill health and services, have more children in order for when they're old, someone's there to look after them. So even in Australia, Aboriginal families have much higher rates of children than white people do. So often the reason why white people have few children is because of their consumerist lifestyle and the cost of education. So it's got mixed kind of attitudes. But the, the thing I wanted to talk about is when you talk about the collapse of the Anthropocene and entering the Symbiocene, I see them both happening together, that we are entering into global catastrophe one way or another, both politically and environmentally, but small pockets Oh, of the symbiosis in communities is where it will happen and that's why I like the work that like Liz is leading here in the Blue Mountains where mm. small communities try it out yeah. and in small communities they get and begin to demonstrate it and what I love about your work then is as you said it gives a story to the new generation of a direction that they can work towards mm -hmm. that's not just a reversal to primit so-called primitive living but is full of new scientific mm -hmm. exploration and ideas that, that can actually be implemented. But mm -hmm. being realistic, both are going to happen at once. Of course. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't mean to suggest that um, there would be this instant where we move from the Anthropocene to the Symbiocene. But I'm looking forward to the collapse of the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. you know? It'll be ugly though. Oh, I, I think it... W what, 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 what else could it be? It, it will, it will, it's ugly. It will its ugly. collapse will be Painful. ugly as well. Many people will die. Millions will be displaced. That's the reality. Well, that depends on how fast we can build the symbiosis. No, it's how it's going to happen. Well, <laughs> life's not <complex. laughs> we, we can politely disagree on the street. <laughs> who are stuck under the current one will come out into the next one much better off and some of the people who are perhaps doing better in this particular um, environment will have to actually bear the cost of it. I don't necessarily think that's... Um, Tell that to the Africans, fleeing civil war and violence and desertification. Yeah, but they're doing that now. Like, that's the point. So as it, as it sort of moves on, I don't think it'll be worse. I think it'll just shift where it is. And hopefully become better. I mean, well, that, that's that, the long term, isn't it? That's the long term. I, I give it up. Uh, <coughs> you know, I've, I've got a, uh, a an image uh, which is the opposite of the climate change one, where it's just getting redder and redder on the spectrum. So I've got it. Uh, I think it's up to 2024. It's going bright red, and then after that, it's gradually shifting into a, a, a pinky zone, and then. It's, it, it changes the spectral colours until it's, of course, green by 2050. So the Anthropoc Anthropocene started roughly uh, in 1950. It coincides with my lifetime, so I'm a child of the Anthropocene. Uh, and it will end, long, I mean, I'm not going to make it till uh, uh, 2050, but uh, I, I can see the speed at which we change. Uh, given I gave you a glimpse of some of the uh, the you know the people at the forefront of the tech, scientific and technological changes that are already taking mm -hmm. place. Uh, if we push them harder, push against the the subsidies and the, and the gross inequalities in the Anthropocene, I, I mm -hmm. believe that we can be close to um, calling the Symbiocene uh, you know in place by 2050, by 2100. They'll take solastalgia out of the dictionary because we're all so happy. Up the bat. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, have you seen the, the cancer of, of uh, Anthropocene is capitalism and neoliberalism? And, and uh, your concept of uh, symbiosis uh, would be the society moving towards a certain uh, philosophical anarchy? Probably. It doesn't need a ruler. That's no, for sure. I mean, in a sense, um, uh, the uh, capitalism is based on, on one thing is money. And so Anthropocene is based on profit. If you give a profit and you go to a symbiosis, symbiosis is uh, everyone, like everyone comes together and, and bring things with nature. So it's more anarchist in the sense that like there is no rulers, no. Well, that's right. Is that like that, or is it completely a, a political of uh, there is no political? Well, not the sort of rulers that we have now, but uh, um, Kropotkin, the Russian anarchist, wrote Mutual Aid uh, in 1901. Uh, and, and it's called an anarchist uh, because anarchy literally means order without a ruler. So anarchy doesn't mean bomb throwing and the houses of parliament being blown up. It means order without a ruler. So if you take that as its definition, you're, you're spot on. Uh, but it, at the moment, we live in what I call corrumpalism. Uh, you know, corruption's not strong enough to describe what we're in. Corrompe means to destroy. So we're actually living in a system where those that rule us are destroying the very system that we're trying to exist within. Not just at a biophysical level, but at, as I've said, at a psychological and an emotional level as well. So uh, we've got a lot of, I'm not pretending that this work is easy. I'm suggesting that it can start, and then once it starts, you can't stop it. And so uh, you can't go back into the Anthropocene once I've given you this wonderful glimpse of a future that's worth having. So, and I don't care about the critics, and I, I you know, this huge negativity to the very ideas that I'm putting forward. Well, they can it's be. Actually what you've shown to us, it's already beginning to happen. Yeah, of course. Well, small pockets. But you know, you've mapped it out in those little experiments that are happening. It's happening all over the world in a little bit. So maybe those tendrils, they're gradually they're connecting up. You know, that's well, the... Well, that's right. Uh, but I also it? sense that there are a lot of people that just want to go and have therapy and ignore it all. Up the back. Thanks all. Thanks so much for the lecture. It has been really, really insightful and also quite, I think, inspiring in terms of the ideas that the class presented. Oh. I, something which I kind of yeah. end up thinking about is what kind of values does this embarrassing end up challenging in the society? <coughs> what, I think what kind of values did you say? Uh, what kind of human values? Things like, for example, um, convenience. So we're very used to being able to uh, obtain things very easily from the supermarket. And I think that is one of the biggest drivers for consumerism. Mm -hmm. But what other values would you say does the idea of symbiosing challenge us? I, I probably slip easily between values and emotions. I was talking more about emotions, but value states, you know, are, from an ethical perspective, I'd say, uh, I was just giving you a glimpse with the idea of the good dice, the spiritual uh, relationship with life that is it's at the same time an ethic. It's Schweitzerian. Uh, you know, the, the, the idea that life is the primary force or determinant of our uh, values and ethical uh, commitments are at the base of my work. And so uh, the notion of commitment can only make sense if you're committing to something which has substance, which itself has some kind of validity. And that's also why I've created the symbiocene as an idea or as a meme. It gives an opportunity for people to attach values to it, their own values if they already have them, or to do their symbiography and start thinking about, well, why don't I have a relationship to the beauty, wonder, and vitality of nature. What went wrong in my upbringing or uh, my education where I just missed out on all this? And that's the job of pluriversities and other places to, to provide the opportunity for people to 
rediscover something that they lost or build something new in their life which they know is valuable but it, it just doesn't come out of thin air. Uh, I, I thank you for, the, for your, your compliment, but the, the area that I'm developing needs the work of new people. Uh, you know, it's like uh, a whole encyclopedia opens up. I just do my little bits to get it started. Uh, I want you to uh, answer your own question in a sense, and it's not to just say, I, I don't know what to say. It's, this is massive, the work that's involved. I did mention that it had to be uh, creative, it had to be fast, it has to be furious. And that's in a sense an answer to the other question about, well, how long is this gonna take? Well, it's gonna have to happen real fast. Uh, like so fast that we don't even know how fast it's gonna be. So we have all these Hollywood movies about Fast and Furious, but they're dumb. We need the really smart Fast and Furious. <laughs> so we, do, we don't need big guys with muscles driving fast cars. We, we need just ordinary people with normal bodies uh, using their intelligence because we're humans to figure out a future that's worth living in. Now, I can't do that by myself, sorry, need help. <laughs> uh, now I've lost track of who. Yeah, um... Thank you. Um, I remember uh, it was 1989 and I was in Brazil on the border of uh, Uruguay and Argentina and Brazil where there's these magnificent waterfalls and I went on a bus trip to see a large section of uh, the river being dammed to make a hydroelectric system that would use almost more than half its power just to get the power to the cities that wanted it. And so I wanted to do this like dramatic leap off the waterfalls as a, as a statement of my despair. And that despair wasn't for the world that was changing around me or because I was going to lose food. It was, a, it was a real empathy or compassion for what was in front of me being destroyed. And I wonder if, if humans looked more at... Um, we've got to fix this or we're going to wipe ourselves out if we looked more at look at what we're doing to the planet and we need we need to help save it um so whether there's a word for that empathy compassion um rather than about what it's doing to me mm. to see what it's doing to the planet and basically we need to go into the emergency room and try and save the planet um <laughs> And I think your symbiosis does that, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I worry that some of the language describing Earth emotions, describing how it makes us humans feel about how it's affecting our lives mm -hmm. as opposed to how it makes us feel from a compassionate point of view. If, if I see another person hurt, I feel bad. Um, we're good at that as humans mm. and we need to, in the symbiosis, we need to feel that way about the micro grubs as well. Like we need to know that they are as important as us in the equation and stop worrying about how many babies we have. Um, actually, we need to worry about how we help the planet. Look, I, I agree entirely. Um, the micro grubs, though, are in fact us. Yeah. Yeah, so our microbiome is what keeps me awake, gives, gives me the energy to stand up in front of you for an hour. So I walk this earth courtesy, courtesy of my gut bacteria. My eyelashes would be full of um, uh, infection if it wasn't for my eyelash mites cleaning out the dead skin at the bottom of my follicles. So, uh, there are truly an organisms in my mouth that help me um, digest food. Um, in other words, I'm a walking, talking, microbiome on a large scale. So that's part of what we have to do is that um, this idea of the self uh, as an individual uh, is completely erroneous. We are holobionts, as Margulis put it. We are trillions of organisms, multiple species, all existing in the same time space. What we're doing is sharing the common life. And so we're not isolated egos, we're, we're not cells, we are holobionts, which is a scientific term, maybe the poets need to work on that one. Uh, 
Yeah, I, it, it, <laughs> so, so in, in other words, I agree with you 100%, but what we have to do is transform our view of ourselves. We are not what we thought we were. We are, in fact, a multitude of species all working together and sharing the one life. Every time I breathe or fart, microbiomes are being shared. So you just have to start thinking about your extended self from the micro to the macro. Now all I can think about is you fart. <laughs> <laughs> you take me fart too seriously. All these new words to me are quite fascinating. But I was just thinking, uh, I do ethics with young children. I've got 14, roughly 14. Some weeks it's a bit more, a bit less. And of those children, there are three who appear to be on the autistic spectrum. There are two who have eating issues. There are two who can't sit still and they tell me they've been diagnosed as ADHD. And I'm wondering if maybe I can add another word. <laughs> Could there be a familial um, solace that families actually are infecting their children with this fear of, of the world because it seems strange that so many children have so many strange illnesses that never used to exist mm. so well look it's not my field but uh, i mean I, uh, I i consider richard lube to to be a good colleague and friend of mine and i mean he just his answer is a dose of nature will help all of those children and that the more nature that they can get the better off they'll be and it applies to adults as well i mean we get benefits from uh, being in a forest in ways that we can't even imagine there are uh, microbes that we breathe in from pine trees for example uh, not typically australian of course uh, we get our our elixirs of life from from eucalypts but there's a whole microbiome in forest that we rely on to have good clean healthy air uh, and so this idea of uh, that our children are they're locked in hermetically sealed lives they're born in hospitals they go home in air-conditioned cars they live in air-conditioned houses their schools are, uh, are cut off from the rest of the world then they if they survive all that in universities they go and work in offices that are cut off from the rest of the world so it's no wonder we end up having this alienation from the life that supports us. Um, and that's part of what I mean about having to re-educate ourselves. Uh, that's a process that's going to take time. But, I mean, I've, I've been an environmental educator for my, my whole life. I've even managed to have some students that survived me. You know, that, So, in other words, I'm, I'm totally committed to this idea that our education system has to be part of the symbiote scene like music, art, everything has to be part of it. Uh, and so symbiosine music, reconnecting music to life and its, its wonders, symbiosine art, symbiosine drama, poetry, you name it. It's not to mean that this theme dominates them, but the connection back to life, using materials that connect hands to the earth, using... Uh, the imagination in a way that's been confined to four square walls. And, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's not something which I think is uh, mind-bogglingly hard. But I think there's a huge amount of research and work that needs to be done in that area. And people like Richard Louvre uh, in the USA has been hugely successful in creating environments where children thrive, where they overcome a lot of the the barriers that are now being diagnosed and described as ADHD and various other categories. I'm, I have no doubt that they're more common now than they were before, but I think we know why. Um, it's, it's connected to, you know, let, let's call it an Anthropocene madness. Why do we, why do we sub subject our children to this? And it's horrible. And in the beautiful Blue Mountains, I would expect the children in the city probably this a greater percentage of children. It's all the more reason to be inside. Outside's too dangerous. Yeah. You know, you want, you, you, 
Yes. Um, just to clarify a couple of points here. Sure. Um, it is my field, and the research has not been definitive on the causes of the well observed increasing rates of AD, ASD in particular, mm -hmm. autism. Um, it, they think, they who do this research, think it might be pollution. I think there's a real danger in 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 looking at what parents are doing to their children to to destroy them, um, mainly because that tends to be point the finger tends to end up being pointed at women. And the second point I'd like to make is the relationship between um, lower birth rates and increased education levels is actually increased le le education levels for women. When girls think they have opportunities outside of the house and outside of raising children, that's what they will choose. No, 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 I don't understand. Just, uh, this, by the way, Anthony Albrecht, uh, symbiocene musician, he might also want to say something uh, about a concert coming up. I wonder if I might introduce your next speaking engagement, Glenn. Yes. Um, so, greetings everyone, my name is Anthony Albrecht, and perhaps I'm only allowed to do this because I am Glenn's son. Um, I'm a musician and I think I became one because I was interested in how one could manifest these extraordinary emotional experiences for people. And about five years ago I founded uh, the Bowerwood Collective um, with my partner Simon. And I think the two of us did that because we were desperate to use the emotional power of music to bring people's emotional energy and focus it into nature and the environment and conservation issues. Um, I feel, you know, inspired and, and hopeful, kind of being reminded why we're doing what we're doing um, by listening to Dad this evening. So thanks. Professor, <laughs> you'll, you'll be pleased to know that um, you get less than a month from now, Glenn will be speaking again at an event that we've organised uh, in the Megalon Valley called the Lyrebird Festival. So um, the Bowerbird Collective makes art for nature and that weekend we're performing six <laughs> concerts of, of music um, presented um, in, in some beautiful spaces down in the Megalon Valley. All the programs are basically nature inspired. Some of the concerts are actually multimedia experiences where we'll tell a story using music, um, uh, projected video and soundscapes. And then some of them feature compositions that we've created, uh, you know, based on specific uh, nature phenomena. So all the concerts I hope would appeal to you, but there's, there's also, um, a series of talks. Um, the professor here will be giving one of them, and uh, we've we've also got um, the wonderful environmental artist um, Janet Lawrence, who's um, exhibiting in uh, what's called the Dairy Shed uh, in a field opposite the um, Megalon Tea Rooms. Her her elixir lab will be in that shed. And she'll be talking about it and its its attempt to engage people with a multi-sensory experience of, of natural things. Um, there's uh, the great wildlife recordist Andrew Skiok talking about deep listening and also a talk um, by two renowned um, eco-architects who are probably going to be considering a career change um, after they leave the land. But um, I can't remember the names right now, but they're, they're very highly regarded um, environmental architects. So wh whether it's the concerts or the talks or even the nightly frogging walks that get you down into the Megalong Valley, we'd love to see you there. It's the final weekend, weekend in November, um, the, t the 23rd through the 26th. And um, like Jill and Glenn, I'm also now um, relocating myself to the Blue Mountains. Um, I very much admire uh, this community of people, very grateful to, you know, have the chance to introduce myself. So um, come and say hi, and um, yeah, look forward to, to spending more time with you all. Lyrebird Festival, thank you very much. <laughs>
Well, it, it was just several people have mentioned ADHD. Um, I, for many years, was president of the Society for Emotionally Disturbed Children, which is a terrible term in Canada. And we wanted to change the name to Society for Emotional Development in Children. And it tells you about our society. You can't raise any money for the emotional development, but you can raise lots of money for emotionally disturbed. <laughs> anyway, we, we did extensive work with these children to find what they were allergic to and what their nutritional and environmental compact was. Um, and we found 60% of these children were allergic to milk um, yeah. and uh, about 30% to, to grains. And when we got them off the milk, they turned out to not be the black sheep, sheep, sheep of the family, but the smart kid of the family. <laughs> so every, every one of those children, when they came to us, were, was on Ritalin. Every single one of them got off Ritalin, and they became healthy children. We organized a summer camp that they all came on, and um, it was an incredibly emotional time for me. There were some children there who had never spoken and some, some of them spoke for the first time at seven years old. And they'd chosen not to speak before that. Um, so all of those children were curable without drugs mm -hmm. through managing their environments and envi their contact with nature and their engagement with food and chemicals. Some of those children couldn't sit on a plastic sheet because the outgassing of the plastic into their bottoms while they were sitting on it was enough to turn them indistinguishable from schizophrenia. So it's, it's that sort of tip of the iceberg of understanding of our susceptibility and sensitivity to nature and, and the things we get exposed to and the inability of the medical profession to deal with that in of what I call the front end, whereas what they're focused on is at the back end. As a medico said to me, none of us suffer from a headache because of the deficiency of aspirin in the blood. <laughs> yeah. So how would you describe the role of visioning and the arts and the really compelling storytelling here? Whoa, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a philosopher, not an artist. <laughs> Look, um, I, I'm inspired by the number of creative people that have taken up ideas that I've just not thrown out there, but put carefully out into the world in the hope that someone would be interested. And they do a fantastic job of taking these wild ideas further than I could possibly imagine in ways that are just so creative using whatever modality is their particular uh, way of engaging with life art artistically. So all I can say by way of an answer is if you say are interested in a response, an artistic response to a concept like solastalgia, just look it up. There are thousands and thousands of them now. Every day there's a new art exhibition using that as a theme. I take that as a bad sign because it means that uh, solastalgia, we're in the age of solastalgia. But you can also find films that have been done by um, uh, you know, creative people in, in Belgium on uh, Uti area. You can find uh, the symbio scene in film now. You can find it in art, art and drama. So I see my job as providing the stimulus. I see the work of creatives. I mean, I, I'm a creative, I create words. But the real creatives are people who are doing uh, the things within art and, uh, and, and the culture generally that no one else is thinking of, that no one else is doing it this way. And so if you feel inspired by anything that I do, just take it as given. I don't charge for the symbiosis. Entry is free. <laughs> it was free here tonight as well. So in other words, 
uh, it's a, a, a process, if you like, of uh, osmosis or symbiosis. It's the coming together of things in a way that uh, the outcome is not predictable. But I, I can say with all honesty that the, co the cultural and creative response to my neologisms has been uh, a, a complete revelation for me because I, I don't have that mentality. I, I don't have an artistic bone in me. Those that do seem to be taking it uh, faster and further than I can uh, and I just take my hat off to them. I, I do wear a beret. Uh, so if I would normally, I'd normally just whip it off. Uh, it's a tie-dyed beret, so I'm a bit quirky. Uh, so that's what I want you to do, is just uh, in your own way respond to these things. Uh, if you're a creative person, there will, there will be an outlet for it. And that outlet is also, you know, uh, you would call it a kind of psychological, um, almost... Uh, a therapeutic way of dealing with the stress that we're in in the Anthropocene. The, the act of taking the stuff that's really bothering us and turning it into its opposite uh, is intensely therapeutic. Uh, that maybe is why I do the work that I do, otherwise it would drive me nuts. So it, it's just an invitation, an open invita invitation to see in your own way how through your own symbiography uh, to respond. And that's one of the great things about creativity is that it's, it's quirky. It comes out of nowhere. No one else does it because you, you're the one that creates it. So I just encourage you to do it and enjoy it. Could I, could I ask one question? No. Uh, <laughs> of course you can. When I've been pondering, pondering about what you said about GDP to GSP yeah. Yeah. and how people can conceive of that and imagine it, when um, Cuba had the oil cut off and they suddenly couldn't do gross domestic product anymore, mm. One of the big things that changed was they started putting a lot into education and educating doctors and exporting doctors mm. around the world. Is that an example of what, what well, you I mean think, in a way? Or? I think it's close. Because we don't have um, an economic model of what uh, the symbiocene will deliver. I mean, we've got the circular economy, we've got the donut model and there are a whole lot of others that uh, are floating around now but I don't think they've really nailed the idea of symbiosis that you know we're just circling more of the same and I've never liked donuts so that's that's, <laughs> the, that's the end of that um, so the symboikos uh, the economy which is run by humans based on symbiosis we got a glimpse of it with what some people are doing, but there's nothing systematic about it. Uh, so this is going to be truly revolutionary for a lot of people on the planet. Roughly 50% are not going to uh, be uh, anticipating this. The other 50% are living close to a kind of proto um, symbiocene anyway. They have no choice. They're living close to nature. They're, they're, they're having to uh, live... Uh, subsist in a way that's very close to life and the, and, the, and the earth in a very intimate way. They still haven't lost all of their animism. It's, the, it's us that have to make these massive changes. So, you know, and I think if, I, if I'm given a choice between the horrors and the depression and worse of the Anthropocene, and a vision of the future, which is either you know the symbiocene or something like it. I don't go for the symbiocene any day. I don't. I don't actually want to stay where I am. I want to move. Uh, and so I see the the process of change, not in terms of mass depression and uh, and conflict. I see it as the opposite. This is actually what human beings want. Uh, they want it for themselves and they want it for their children. Uh, how do we get out of the fixation that we're in that there's nothing else but more of 
what we've had before. Well, that's going to be a shock, but actually I think it's a pleasant one, not a really depressing one. Uh, I think that gives humans the chance to be what we are, homo, homo sapiens. However, um, you know, I have to say that there aren't many of me giving these talks <laughs> around the world at the moment. Uh, if I wanted to make a million writing a book, I'd write one on, uh, on the Anthropocene and it's, it's collapse. You know, it's big money. Everyone likes looking at that accident. Uh, they like paying money to watch the accident. So it's going to require some clear thinking. And uh, I think the Cuba case study is a good one where when gross national product is challenged seriously, uh, we, we can begin to think about some other kind of product that's not just collapsology. That's a discipline, by the way. It's doing really well worldwide. Um, but I, I sort of welcome collapse. Um, it's, it's not just a yin and a yang thing. It's that what we've got now ought to collapse. This is back to that question earlier about values. Uh, yeah, I have a set of values, and they probably come out as uh, ethics and politics, but I'm not going to hammer anyone here tonight with my ethics and my politics. I'm just giving you the idea that uh, symbiocracy is going to be a hell of a lot better than corrupted democracy. Demos, of the people. Well, we're not people. We're hollow biomes. <laughs> we need to share our, our politics with more than humans because we are more than human. Yeah, I did some politics for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Another big round of applause.